Hello, this is Christine Linke, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, Dr. John Hull will present Counterparty Risk, Central Clearing, and CBA. Dr. Hull is the Maple Financial Professor of Derivatives and Risk Management at the Joseph L. Brotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He is an internationally recognized authority on derivatives and risk management. He was, with Alan White, one of the winners of the NICO LOR research competition for, this, for his work on the whole white interest rate model and was in 1999 voted Financial Engineer of the Year by the International Association of Financial Engineers. He has won many teaching awards, including University of Toronto's prestigious Northrop Frye Award. He is the author of three books, including Risk Management in Financial Institutions, Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives, Fundamentals of Futures and Options Markets. The third edition of Risk Management and Financial Institutions was published by Wiley in April of this year. Dr. Hull is the co-director of Rotman's Master of Finance program. In addition to the University of Toronto, Dr. Hull has taught at York University, the University of British Columbia, New York University, Cranfield University, as well as London Business School. He is also the associate editor of eight academic journals, and we are honored to have his presentation today. Please feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Hull via the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the session as time allows. Following this webinar, a link to the presentation will be emailed to you along with a link to the recording of today's webinar. So now, Dr. Hull, I will turn the presentation over to you. Okay. okay, thanks very much, Chris, and thank you to Premio for inviting me to give this webinar. Uh, see if the, whoops, I can't advance the slide, let me, oh, here we go. Okay, um, this, is, this is my uh, first slide, and as Chris mentioned, my most recent book, Risk Management and Financial Institutions has just come out. It came out in the third edition about two weeks ago. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of new material in the third edition because this is an area that's uh, seen a lot of changes. Basel 2.5, Basel 3, Dodd-Frank, the changes taking place in OTC markets. And we're going to talk about some of those today. The, <clears throat> I might just mention the first two editions of this book were published by Pearson and I've moved to Wiley for the third edition. Um, and one of the changes in the third edition is that the book's being brought out in paperback, which makes it uh, much more affordable for students. And so if you want more information about the book, you can, uh, you can go to my website, which is at the bottom of the screen, or to, um, or to, the, to the Wiley website. So the topics I'm planning to talk about today are listed here. Um, first one, bilateral versus central clearing, which is an important change taking place in over-the-counter markets. Um, some of the new regulations, CBA and DBA. Uh, and if we get time, I'm not sure whether we will, uh, we'll talk about uh, two areas which I've done research in recently, wrong way risk and the discounting of derivatives. <clears throat> so let's start by um, talking a bit about the OTC market, over-the-counter market. And if we look at the OTC market, it's, it's a market between sophisticated players, typically between financial institutions, corporate treasurers, and fund managers. And we could compare the over-the-counter market with the exchange-traded market, which in some ways is, is more familiar to many of us. Um, compared with the exchange-traded market, the transactions are much larger. And although, of course, there's not as many transactions, but the size of the transactions is huge compared with the exchange-traded market. The transactions can be non-standard, whereas in the exchange-traded market, of course, um, they've got to conform to the um, definitions that the exchange has come up with. But overall, the OTC market has been a very successful market. Pretty much however you choose to measure it, the OTC market is now much larger. 
than the exchange traded market. Now traditionally, moving on to this first bullet point here, trades have been agreed in the OTC market over the phone or through an interdealer broker. So two uh, you know two traders, one working for one um, market participant, another mar working for another market participant would either contact each other directly or they'd go through an interdealer bro broker and end up agreeing to a trade. And typically those trades would be cleared what's called bilaterally. What this means is that um, a derivative dealer would enter into an agreement with each of its counterparties on how the trades with those counterparties would be handled. And of course, the most common sort of agreement would be the International Swaps and Derivatives Association Master Agreement, the ISDA Master Agreement. So we might just sort of talk a little bit about that. The ISDA Master Agreement, basically, I've entered into a bunch of transactions with you, and this is the master agreement defines what happens if one of us doesn't <coughs> do what they're supposed to do according to what the transactions say. So basically, if one side does not live up to its obligations, the is the master agreement defines what happens. Um, so for example, uh, if uh, a payment is due under on a particular transaction it's not made if some collateral has to be posted and it's not posted if uh, if uh, one side to the transaction declares bankruptcy or something like that then then what what the ISDA master agreement basically says is that all the transactions between the two sides get terminated and it defines how that happens what payment is made from one side to the other side and all that sort of thing. Typically, the ISDA Master Agreement has a credit support annex, abbreviated CSA, which defines collateral arrangements. Who has to post collateral, how the collateral is calculated, and that sort of thing. And it also, of course, uh, includes what has become pretty much standard in the over-the-counter market, netting arrangements. So all the transactions that I might have with you would be netted. Um, and that the netting is uh, is relevant for two purposes. One is in terms of the collateral that's posted, in terms of calculating the collateral that might be posted, uh, transactions are netted, and when there is an early termination, the netting comes in again, and uh, the early termination deter the um, netting determines how much one side owes the other side when there is this early termination. OK, so all of this is changing. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say the over-the-counter markets are becoming more like exchange-traded markets. And that's what we really want to talk about here. There's, uh, there's uh, been a lot of legislation, some of it just in the US and some of it more international. Um, <clears throat> one thing the US is very keen on is these things called swap execution facilities, or SEFs. And, and what Dr. Frank says is that whenever possible, uh, trades in the over-the-counter market must be executed on swap execution facilities. So what is a swap execution facility? Well, it's basically a facility where, a bit like an exchange, where many different market participants can post bids and offers, and many different market participants can trade off the bids and offers posted by other market participants. So it's a sort of central clearing um, place but like an exchange, you say what trade you want to do and see if there's somebody else who wants to do that trade with you. Um, <clears throat> fairly similar to some of the things that exist already, I mean, what, what we have right now or what we've had in the past is a dealer might post bids and offers for a particular type of uh, over-the-counter transaction, say an interest rate swap, five-year interest rate swap, and um, other market participants can trade over the, off those bids and offers. The difference with a swap execution facility is that it's not just one dealer that's posting the bids and offers, but many people you can post the bids and offers, and many people can trade off the bids and offers of other market participants. So that's 
making you know at least the standard trades in the over-the-counter market sound a little bit like trades done on an exchange. <clears throat> and the other big change is that all standardized transactions, with a few exceptions, should be cleared centrally through CCPs, which is short for central clearing parties. So instead of being cleared bilaterally, having you know instead of a a, a derivatives dealer having a lot of is the master agreements with all its counterparties. Whenever possible, the legislation says, and this is sort of legislation that's uh, pretty common to most advanced countries throughout the world, whenever possible, trades should be cleared through central clearing parties. And we'll explain, I mean, I'm going to explain what that means in a minute, but it's quite different from bilateral clearing. So it's going to be a big change. It's a big change that's already taking place, in fact. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, there's a typo I see on the the next bullet point. Transactions that are not clear. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, no, that's no, not not a typo. Transactions that are cleared bilaterally. In other words, those that are not standard, um, and uh, so can, the, therefore continue to be cleared bilaterally, will be subject to more capital charges and, at least in the U.S., higher collateral requirements. So uh, the U.S. and Dodd-Frank are determined that even if you can't clear a transaction centrally through a CCP, because it's not a standard transaction that the CCP can cope with, you still have to enter, you know, you still have to have an arrangement with the counterparty where a lot of collateral is posted. Now, there was a concern amongst U.S. banks that if they were required to do this, to highly collateralize transactions which were done bilaterally, but banks in other parts of the world weren't, then they would have a competitive disadvantage. And it's unclear how all this is going to be resolved, but as things stand right now, it looks as though uh, the rest of the world, or in particular, you know, European uh, regulators, are going to be adopting um, adopting um, rules very similar to those in Dodd-Frank. In other words, they are going to be requiring their own banks to uh, highly collateralize transactions that are cleared bilaterally. So you're not really going to gain a lot from clearing things bilaterally because there's still going to be lots of collateral that's going to have to be posted. OK, so jump a bit ahead of myself here. So what is this CCP all about? Um, so <clears throat> here's a sort of I actually took this from a presentation of Daryl Duffy, these, these diagrams. But um, <clears throat> basically, this slide shows the two ways in which we can clear OTC derivative transactions. And the first one, the, the diagram on the left-hand side, is bilateral clearing. And you see here there are eight different dealers. Uh, or eight different market participants denoted by the the dots on the outside of the hexagon and and uh, this <coughs> I guess it's an octagon isn't it not a hexagon uh, and there's, there's there's lines going between each of them uh, you know I think you'll find there's probably 28 lines altogether so those are 28 is the master agreements um, between the eight different market participants that we're assuming. Obviously, there are more than eight, eight market participants. But uh, just, this is just a diagrammatic illustration of, of how bilateral clearing works. So it seems, you know, it seems pretty inefficient. You know, there's all these different is the master agreements between every pair of market participants. Now, if we compare that with the diagram on the right-hand side, that's central clearing, where there's a central clearing party that stands between two sides. So what happens here is that two market participants agree on a deal. They might go through one of these um, swap execution facilities. And then they present it to the central clearing party. And the central clearing party says, OK, we'll handle this deal for you. And we'll stand between 
you know the two sides. And it's very, very similar to an exchange clearinghouse. It's, um, it's, uh, so that, so you, that's why I say that, um, <coughs> you know, the OTC world is becoming very similar to the exchange traded world. In, in <coughs> Now, how does just to show how central clearing works? Um, here's uh, <coughs> here's a simple example. Suppose we've got two companies and they enter into a very simple trade. Um, company A agrees to pay five percent to Company B on some notional principle, and Company B, in return, agrees to pay LIBOR. So this is a sort of plain vanilla interest rate swap. Maybe they agree to do this for five years. So they agree on this trend. They agree on this trade, and as I say, the trade might be agreed um, using a swap execution facility or something like that. And then they present it to a CCP, and the CCP says, "Okay, we'll stand between the two of you." And so the CCP is entering into a swap with Company A and an offsetting swap with Company B. So. Company A, instead of paying 5% to Company B, is paying 5% to the CCP. And Company B, instead of receiving 5% from Company A, is receiving 5% from the CCP. And similarly, with the cash flows throwing it, flowing in the other direction. Um, <clears throat> now, what does the CCP do? It behaves like an exchange clearinghouse. It's going to require initial margin and maintenance margin from the from company A and company B. And of course, this particular transaction with the central clearing party is probably just one of many transactions that company A and company B have. So all the transactions will be combined together, and the CCP will tell company A and company B how much collateral it needs. But it's going to be more collateral than traditionally we've seen in over-the-counter markets. Because when collateral is posted in over-the-counter markets, typically we see a maintenance margin, but uh, we don't see an initial margin. Initial margins are relatively rare in um, CSAs in the over-the-counter market, but there'll be a pretty steep initial margin in this particular case. So the bottom line is a lot more collateral will have to be posted by market participants. and. As you'll see, this is looking very similar to the sort of arrangement we have with an exchange and um, an exchange clearinghouse. When, to, when, for example, if I, I, for example, enter into a futures contract on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I don't know who the party on the other side of the contract is when I enter it. But that doesn't matter because I'm not actually dealing directly with that person. I'm dealing with the exchange clearinghouse. So all I've got to worry about is what is the creditworthiness of the exchange clearinghouse. I don't have to worry about the exchange, the creditworthiness of the person who happened to take the other side of my transaction. And it, it's it's uh, it's similar to, similar arrangement here. Now, just to keep you all awake, we're going to have three polling questions at various times during this presentation. And here's the first one. So pre-crisis. Approximately 25% of over-the-counter transactions were cleared through CCPs. Okay, so if we go back to because these these CCPs have been around for quite a long time, um, but they only they they there was only about 25% of over-the-counter transactions that actually went through CCPs. The rest were cleared bilaterally. So the question here is: Let's. Uh, go about eight years down the road, what percentage do you expect to be cleared through CCPs by January 2020? Okay. And there's four possible answers. A is between 0% and 50%. B is between 50% and 75%. C is between 75% and 90%. And D is more than 90%. Okay, Chris, so are we letting them answer that question now? Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and launch this question, and the audience will have a few moments to record their answers. <laughs> 
Okay, we have a very lively audience here. So uh, we have about 78% of the audience who's voted. I'm going to close the poll and announce the results now. Okay. And Dr. Hull, on this question, we had 3% of the audience selecting answer A, 13% selecting answer B, 52% selecting C, and 31% selecting D. Okay, so clearly, <coughs> clearly the audience believes that uh, CCTs are here, here to stay. We're not going to have a sudden reversal, and the market's going to go back to where it was pre-crisis. At least 3% think that might happen, but the majority were 75% to 90%. And that's probably a, a reasonable way to think about this. Um, right now, actually, we're at about 50%. Um, so I, I said it was 25% pre-crisis. Um, the new legislation is in the process of being implemented now. We're up to 50%. Um, many of the big dealers reckon that um, when the dust settles, seven, you know, we'll be in, in the reverse situation to the one we were in before. 75% of over-the-counter transactions will go through CCPs, and only 25% will be cleared bilaterally. So we'll see how that uh, plays out. So here are some key questions about CCPs, and because obviously there's a lot of concern about um, this tidal wave of change that's taking place in over-the-counter markets. So how many CCPs will there be? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so I'll leave that question. Will there be interoperability? This is this is, um, in other words, will CCPs cooperate with each other as far as netting and that sort of thing is concerned? For example, if I'm a dealer and I've got transactions which are worth, say, plus, plus 50 million with one CCP and worth minus 25 million with another CCP, for the purposes of, of collateral, determine how, you know, how much... Uh, initial margin I have to post, it would be nice if those two could be netted off against each other because then there's... So if, if uh, CCP1 and CCP2 had interoperability, I could net off the plus 50 million with the minus 25 million. As things stand right now, there's very little inter interoperability um, between CCPs. But it may develop, particularly if there's a lot of pressure from the from the, from the customers and the members of CCPs. Um, how much additional collateral will have to be posted by financial institutions? The answer is a lot. Um, there's no question that over-the-counter transactions will be, as I said earlier, much more heavily collateralized uh, going forward. The um, initial margins were, in, the, in bilateral clearing, initial margins were pretty much unheard of prior to uh, this legislation. Actually, they weren't called initial margins in the um, over-the-counter market. They were called independent amounts. But they, they were very rare, um, or fairly, fairly rare, unless you were dealing with a, a, with a counterparty that was you know, demonstrably dodgy. Um, but they're going to be much more sort of part of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis once we move, with, move towards CCPs. And as I say, um, it's going to be a part of the over-the-counter market as well. How should we regulate CCPs to ensure there's no chance of default? Of course, you know, we have a lot of discussion about banks being too big to default. Uh, are we just <laughs> changing, the, changing the game a little bit here? And instead of having banks that are too big to default, you know, we've, we've um, created CCPs that are too big to default. And there's a lot of discussion at the moment about how CCPs should be regulated. And you know, clearly, we'd like them to be like utilities, which have you know, behave in such a way that there's virtually no chance that they'll default. But on, at the end of the day, CCPs are profit-making companies. So they will have to be regulated. And the last regulation I saw was something along the lines that a CCP has a number of members through which transactions are channeled. 
and would the CC would the CCP survive a failure of its two biggest members? It's going to have enough capital to survive a failure of its two biggest members. That's not terribly well defined, but that was the sort of thinking of the regulators last time they looked at that. And then there's the question. I mean, banks have have developed a lot of technology for assessing credit risk in over-the-counter transactions that are cleared bilaterally, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. But um, there's obviously some credit risk in CCP transactions. Um, the CCP itself might, I hope it won't, but the CCP itself might uh, run into financial difficulties. But if there's another member of the CCP, if you're a member of the CCP and there's another member that fails, then you can be on the line to uh, to make the failure good. And <clears throat> will the benefits of netting increase or decrease as a result of CCPs? I think that's an interesting one. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, before we do that, I've got uh, I've got another polling question. Right now, when you add them up, there are about fifteen CCPs throughout the world. Probably LCH ClearNet is probably the biggest, but there's you know add up, look at um, all you know add up all the different ones that have popped up in various countries throughout the world. Probably looking at about 15 right now. How many CCPs do you expect there to be by January 2020? Less than five. That's A. B is between five and 15. C is between 15 and 30, and D is more than 30. So, Chris, shall we allow them to uh, answer those questions? Absolutely. Question? Absolutely. I'll launch that question now, and again, we'll give you a few moments to mark your answers. Okay, I have about 75% of the audience who's voted, so I'm going to close the poll and announce the results now. And on this question, Dr. Hall, we had 11% of the audience selecting answer A, 42% selecting B, 27% selecting C, and 20% selecting D. Okay, so uh, the most popular answer was uh, between 5 and 15, um, but uh, there were some people who thought that CCPs would proliferate and would have more than 30. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, how the, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. One could, one could expect some consolidation amongst CCPs, um, but, uh, you know, the large ones would take over the small ones and, uh, you know, the, the, this, this has certainly been happening as far as um, regular exchanges are concerned. You know, we've seen a lot of consolidation with, um, you know, exchanges merging with other exchanges and being taken over. So that, you know, that's one thing that we could expect to happen. On the other hand, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of countries feel that they want to have their own CCP so that transactions in their in instruments related to their own currencies are a little bit more under their control. So, you know, there's there's there's, there's different pressures as far as that's concerned. So, you know, continuing here, um, I'd like to come back to this netting issue, and does a CCP improve netting? Well, if every single transaction that was done in the OTC market went through a single CCP, then yeah, there would be much more netting than there is now, because what um, dealer A and dealer, what um, market participant A and market participant B would be doing is not only netting the transactions between themselves, but netting, their transac netting those transactions with all the other transactions they have with all the other market participants out there. So that would be what we'd expect to see. But it's not going to be as simple as that. There's going to be some transactions that can be cleared through CCPs and some that can't. And in fact, there's going to be more than one CCP, as we've just discussed. So just to illustrate the sort of issues here, I've uh, got a very simple example. There are three market participants, A, B, and C. And uh, 
let's focus on the left hand side of the di left left hand side diagram for a moment and look at a and b now you'll see this the black line and the dotted blue line the black line is denoting transactions that can't be cleared through the CCP. And the dotted blue line is denoting transactions that can be cleared through a CCP. But if we, if we focus on the left-hand diagram, we haven't brought the CCP into it yet. So if we look at A and B, uh, we've got this arrow with 100 on it going between A and B. And uh, that's indicating that the transactions that can't be cleared through the CCP, because this is the black one, uh, are worth plus 100 to B and minus 100 to A. OK, so B is, B is plus 100 on those transactions, and A is minus 100. And similarly for everything else. So if we look at the transactions that can be cleared through a CCP, um, that's between A and B. That's represented by the blue dotted line. And those transactions are plus 50 to A and minus 50 to B. So when they're, <clears throat> when they're clearing things bilaterally, A and B would, would of course, net off those transactions. So um, the transactions would be netted off, and B would be plus 50, and A would be minus 50 on the, on the transactions between the two. And so B would have an exposure of 50 to A, and A would have no exposure to B because B has got positive value in its transactions with A, and A has negative value in its transactions with B. And then we could look at B and C. And in fact, B is, when we add the two sets of transactions together, B is plus 50 with C, and C is minus 50 with B. So in total, B's exposure after the bilateral netting is 100. It's got an exposure of 50 to A and 50 to C. And that's what the table underneath is showing, uh, whereas A has no exposure because um, it's minus 50 as far as B is concerned, and it's minus 20 as far as C is concerned. So therefore, you know, it's got no exposure because if either B or C defaulted, it doesn't mind because it's uh, out of the money on its transactions with those two market participants. So you can see in the table below, A has no exposure, B has a total exposure of 100, and C has a total exposure of 20. Um, and the average exposure of the three market participants is 40. Now let's go over to the right-hand diagram and uh, bring the CCP into it. Um, and then the blue dotted blue transactions go through the CCP. And that has some benefits because you know A can, in principle, uh, A can net off its transactions that it has with B with the tra with the, do the dotted blue transactions it has with B with the dotted blue transactions it has with C, and and, and 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 B can do similarly. Well, you can see how that works out. In in fact, um, the exposure after netting. Is, is greater than it was before. I mean, there's the issue as to whether you include the CCP in the exposure. If you say the CCP is risk-free, we don't really care about our exposure to the CCP. That would bring us onto the final column of the table, which is the exposure after netting excluding the CCP. But even there, we see that the exposure after netting excluding our exposure to the CCP is, on average, greater than it was before. It's uh, in fact, it's, it's 120 instead of 100 for B, and 90 instead of 20 for C. So you can see it's not, it's not necessarily the case that the benefits of netting will increase as a result of CCPs, because there's a benefit, but there's also a disbenefit, because you, you, know, you, know, you no longer can uh, you can no longer net off the uh, non-standard transactions with the standard transactions, which you could do before with bilateral clearing. And of course, we've only got one CCP here. It's, uh, it gets, gets worse when you've got several CCPs. OK, now I want to uh, 
change topics a little bit and talk a bit, a bit about CVA. So we're now going back to the uh, bilateral clearing and talking about how, how banks assess credit risk in bilateral clearing. And there's this thing called CBA, the credit value adjustment, which dealers calculate as the cost to the dealer of the possibility of a counterparty default. So a dealer will calculate one, CV, one CBA for each of its counterparties. Um, so Lehman, for example, when it defaulted, we found out that it had 8,000 different derivatives counterparties. So Lehman would calculate 8,000 different, before it defaulted, 8,000 different CBAs. So it's a, it's, it's a big computational exercise, the calculation of CBA. And what do you, how do you calculate CBA? Well, this diagram illustrates the way it's done. Um, you look at all your transactions with a particular counterparty and say, well, what's the life of the longest transaction that I have? Maybe it's 23 years. So that would be capital T. So you've got the time between now and 23 years to worry about. And you divide that time into a number of time intervals. So I'd say the capital T there is the 23 years. And it, in the way I've done the diagram, the intervals are equal. But they, they don't have to be, and they usually aren't. Usually the intervals would be smaller at the beginning and, and larger at the end. But you choose a number of time intervals over the lives of life of your derivative portfolio, and you calculate two things for each time interval. You calculate the default probability, which I'm calling Q. So Q1 is the probability that your counterparty will default in the first interval between 0 and T1. Q2 is the probability your counterparty will default between T1 and T2. Q3 is the probability between T2 and T3, and so on. Um, and and then the Vs are the present value of your net exposure. So how much do I stand to lose if the counterparty defaults? So you calculate your net exposure, usually at the mid midpoint of the intervals. So V1 is how much, after taking collateral into account and that sort of thing, how much do we stand to lose on average? Um, so I guess we could say it's the PP of the expected net exposure. Um, how much do we expect to lose on average if there's a default at the midpoint of the first interval, second interval, and so on? And then we multiply the Qs by the Vs, add them all up, and multiply by 1 minus the recovery rate. And that's what CBA is. So basically, for each of our counterparties, we've got to say, what's the chance of the counterparty defaulting at different times? And how much could we lose if the counterparty does default at these different times? Um, multiply one by the other and add them up, multiply by one minus the recovery rate. And that's, a, that's the essence of the CVA calculation. <clears throat> now, uh, how do we get the Qs and the Vs? The, the Qs are actually calculated from credit spreads. So you look at your counterparty's credit spreads and deduce, estimate what the Qs are from that. The Vs are more difficult to calculate for the Vs, we, um, we need to do a Monte Carlo simulation of the market variables underlying our portfolio. And um, and say, well, we have this simulation trial, which is one way in which the future may uphold. What's our exposure to the counterparty at the midpoint of each of the intervals for this Monte Carlo trial? And then you do the next Monte Carlo trial get your exposures on the next Monday trial, the trial, and so on. And then you have to average and say, on average, how much do we lose if there's a default at these different times? So that's a much bigger exercise. Um, so you choose, as it says here, you choose random paths for all the market variables, and the net exposure is calculated as the midpoint of each time interval. Now, Collateral introduces some interesting issues into all of this. If there's no collateralization, the net exposure of the default time for a particular Monte Carlo trial is just the maximum of the value of the derivatives is zero. In other words, if the value of the derivatives is, is plus 25 million, then that's, your, that's how much you could lose. 
and you multiply by one minus the recovery rate. If it's uh, minus 10 million, then you wouldn't lose anything if the counterparty defaulted. But if there's a CSA, credit support annex, that you have with the counterparty, then you've got to say, well, how much collateral would we expect to be posted at the time of the default? And then you start thinking, well, if the counterparty defaults, chances are the counterparty hasn't posted collateral for a while. And so there's this thing called a cure period, which is the period immediately before the default during which collateral has not been posted. And so basically you've got to say, well, in terms of calculating how much collateral will be available at the default time, you've got to sort of look back, see days, and say, well, what was the situation the last time the count we would have expected the counterparty to post collateral? And, and uh, build that into the Monte Carlo simulation. <clears throat> OK, so here's polling question number three. I think I may ha I, I'm going to have to explain the terminology a little bit here, but how much does a zero threshold collateral arrangement, when compared with no collateral, reduce CBA? So I want you to consider two things. One, you've got a typical portfolio with a counterparty, and consider two situations. One where there's no collateral, and the other where you have what's called a zero threshold collateral arrangement, which basically means that if if you have um, a portfolio which is worth, say, plus 15 million to you, the counterparty has to post 15 million of collateral with you. If the portfolio is negative, the, the, um, the counterparty doesn't have to post anything. So collateral is posted. Um, and, uh, but of course, there is this cure period. So when there's a default, there will have been a period of time, and typically people think about 15 to 20 days, a period of time during which collateral has not been posted. So if you compare those two arrangements, one where your um, the maintenance margin, if you want to call it that, is is there. Not a, there's no initial margin, but there's a full maintenance margin to use the um, exchange traded terminology, and the other where the no collateral is posted. So how much does it reduce CVA for a typical portfolio? Is it 25%, 50%, 75%, or 95%? Okay, everyone, I'm going to launch this question, so, and we'll you give like you some time. Launch, Sorry you. to speak over you, Dr. Hull. I've launched the question, okay. and um, we'll give some time for the audience to mark their answers. Okay, we have about 70% of the audience voting, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and announce the results. And on this question, Dr. Hull, we had 5% of the audience selecting answer A, 27% selecting B, 33% selecting C, and 35% selecting D. Okay. And in fact, this is, this is something which I've done a lot of work on, in fact, and, and D is the correct answer. Um, I've, uh, I've worked with quite a number of portfolios which, uh, which banks have and the impact of collateral on those portfolios. And I mean, your risk, if you've got a, a zero threshold collateral arrangement, your risk is really just the risk associated with the cure period. And um, that is, of course, quite a lot less than the total risk that you would have if you were totally uncollateralized. So um, it turns out that 95% is pretty close to the right answer for most of the portfolios that I've looked at. Of course, there can be particular portfolios which might be different. Okay, a couple more points about CVA. Um, 
it's a huge computational exercise calculating CVA because you've got m large dealer, you've got many, many counterparties, and you've got to do this Monte Carlo simulation for each one. Um, so what, what you try and do is to store all the results, you know, everything that was sampled in the Monte Carlo simulation, you remember it, because that makes it easy to calculate the incremental impact of a new trade. You can do it without redoing the whole simulation. If the trader, you know, if, if uh, overnight we calculate CVA for a particular counterparty, and then the next day the trader says, I'd like to do another trade with that counterparty, you can uh, just simulate that new trade and work out what um, what the incremental in impact of the new trade is on the CVA. It's relatively straightforward. So that's a little tri computational trick, if you like. It makes saves a lot of computation time. Okay, I'd just like to mention DVA, which um, is much more controversial than CVA. It's um, DVA is sort of looking at CVA the other way around and saying, if you look at things from the point of view of the counterparty, what's the counterparty's credit risk to the dealer? How much on average does the counterparty expect to lose because of a dealer default? And of course, the formula is exactly the same, except we've got to redefine the variables. QI is now the dealer's probability of defaulting during those different intervals that we had um, back here. So QI is now the default probability of the dealer, and PV is the net is the present value of the expected exposure of the counterparty to the dealer. And uh, <coughs> accounting standards, particularly those in the US, now require the calculation of DVA as well as CVA. And the adjustment for credit risk is that the value of transactions with a counterparty is the no default value minus CVA plus DVA. So you subtract off CVA, which is the cost of the potential defaults from the counterparty, and add DVA, which is uh, the um, cost to the counterparty that you yourself may default. Why do you add DVA? Well, because the fact that you may default on these transactions is actually something of value to your shareholders. You know, and of course, it's difficult to say, well, geez, how do I monetize DVA? It's a nice idea, but and that's why I say it's a fairly controversial thing, but accountants seem to seem to like it. So, but it does have some strange effects. Um, if we look at the third quarter increases in the credit spreads of U.S. banks in 2011, all the credit spreads of U.S. banks went up in the third quarter of 2011. As a result, DVA went up, because if the credit spreads went up, then the probability of default of those banks went up. So DVA went up, and so therefore it was a boost to their income, uh, which which is kind of strange. You know, you see, I mean, presumably, if your credit spread goes up, that indicates that uh, you know there's some problems with the financial sector in general, and maybe you in particular, and yet that, in, that that's, uh, increases the, the calculated probability that you yourself will default, and therefore um, indicates, increases DVA. And it turns out that, you know, there's quite a lot of publicity about this, because it turns out that the impact of the increase in DVA on the bottom line of these banks sort of swamped other things. So it was uh, it was a major uh, it had a major impact. Okay, let's. Uh, so I'll just mention one more thing, and then um, we'll we'll skip on to the end. Um, CVA risk. There's two sources of risk in CVA. Um, one is the risk of changes in counterparties' credit spreads, which we've just seen for banks, and the other is change. So one is the QI risk, which is the change risk arising from the probability of default, and the other is the risk arising from the VI risk, which is the changes in the market variables underlying the portfolio. And uh, Basel III requires the CVA risk, 
arising from a parallel shift in the term structure of credit spreads to be included in the calculation of capital for market risk, but it doesn't require banks to include CVA risk arising from uh, the underlying market variables themselves. So, so what Basel III is saying is, yeah, there's some risks in CVA. I mean, CVA itself is like a, is a complex derivative, and uh, we want you to take some of those risks into account uh, when we calculate your market risk capital. OK, now I was going to talk about two more things. Uh, one area I've done research on, wrong-way risk, right-way risk. There's a paper on my website, which is at the bottom of the slide here, which, uh, which uh, talks about that research. So skip over that. And then I was also going to talk about some, if, if we had time, another t issue, which is how derivatives market participants actually choose the risk-free rate. Uh, when they trade derivatives, and uh, how in particular they use the risk-free rate for discounting. Now, this, if you're going to the Premier Conference, this is the topic that I'm going to be talking about at the Premier Conference, because uh, there's been a move away from using the LIBOR and swap rate as the benchmark risk-free rate for discounting towards using the OIS rate, and I'll be talking about that at the Premier Conference. So, uh, I'll a few slides on that, but there'll be quite a lot more slides that I'll be using at the Premier Conference. So, oops, and here we go. So, jump over these slides and uh, move over to questions. Um, and Dr. Hall, we did get several questions in, so that they Chris? should. Yes, I am. We did get some questions in, and they should be waiting for you in your question pane. I um, also was wondering if, um, just to jump off the question and answer period, if you could remark on um, whether you would say your book is more about risk management or is it more about regulation of financial institutions? Well, that, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Because um, in, in business schools, typically we've had an elective in risk management and an elective in financial institutions, and they've been quite different electives. Um, you know, the financial institutions elective has talked a bit about regulation and the different sorts of financial institutions out there and so on. Um, there's, there's a convergence between these two fields now. So the answer is my book's about both. My book's about risk management, market risk, credit risk, operational risk, and all of those sorts of things. And it's about the way in which banks are regulated. Um, you know, Basel I, Basel II, Basel II.5, Basel III, and so on, Dodd-Frank. And those those two are, are very closely related. So I see a convergence between risk management and the regulation of financial institutions. So it's very appropriate to have the two in the same book. OK, let's, uh, let's see what other questions we've got here. Is there a, oh, sorry, looking at the first question, is there a view on how much capital charge and collateral will be required to be posted bilaterally versus with a CCP? Yeah, it, what I've read on this is that uh, what the regulators are trying to achieve is equality between the um, collateral that has to be posted if you clear your trades through a CCP versus if you trade, clear your trade bilaterally. You know, the, the sort of rule of thumb here is that you want to be 99% or 99.5% certain that the collateral will be enough to cover you over a, a period of maybe five days if there's a default. So those sorts of uh, calculations are done by exchange clearinghouses. They'll be done by C they're done by CCPs, and they'll be done in determining the regulatory over-the-counter capital. So I mean, what regulators want to ensure is that Participants in the over-the-counter market don't play games. Trying to move their trades away from CCPs to uh, to bilateral clearing because they don't want the collateral to be, have to be posted. In fact, the regulators are trying to ensure that there won't be any benefits to, to doing that. I mean, you could play games. You could add a little option to an interest rate swap, for example, an out-of-the-money option to an interest rate swap, and suddenly it's no longer a standard transaction that can be cleared through a CCP, 
but I, I, they're trying to ensure there's really no incentive to do that. Uh, next question, what will happen to all the existing bilateral is there with institution? Will they go away or will they have to be rewritten? Yeah, I mean, I think ISDA is uh, doing quite a lot of work rewriting its contracts. I mean, the ISDA master agreements will not go away because they'll still be, pro estimates are 25% of over-the-counter transactions will be cleared bilaterally. But clearly the, um, the CSAs have got to be rewritten to conform to what's coming out as the new regulations on collateral requirements. So is the master agreements will still be important, but probably not as important as they are now because they'll only deal with about 25% of what's going on. How do I define these ratios? How do I define? The next question is how do I define this 25%, 50%, and so on? And uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think we do it by, um, I, I, I think the way it's usually done is by the notional principle. Um, I'm not 100% certain about that. I'm quoting statistics that other people have come up with here. Um, One question here, will there be transactions between CCPs? And if so, what will the criteria on collateral and capital charges be? Yeah, one well, would like to think that the CCPs themselves will not be doing too much trading. Uh, they're, um, as I say, uh, one would like to think they'll behave like utilities and manage, you know, manage themselves so that they're taking as little risk as possible. When you talk about will there be transactions between CCPs, um, one wonders, you, 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 know, you, you start thinking, geez, well, they're just going to be like another too-big-to-fail bank. Um, um, <coughs> so I think there probably are restrictions. There probably will be restrictions as far as that is concerned. Um, are CCPs going to mark to market daily the same as for exchange? Uh, an exchange? Yes, absolutely. What, the, what will happen? And it's more complicated than what an exchange does because if I'm JP Morgan and I'm dealing with um, LCH ClearNet, I, I've got a huge portfolio that I'm clearing through the CCP, and the CCP will net all those transactions off against each other and say, well, uh, JP Morgan is now, you know, plus 500 million as far as its transactions with the CCP, and it, and it will do that calculation every single day, and Part of so if it's plus 500 million, then J.P. Morgan has to post 500 million with the CCP, but it will also have to post an initial margin or independent amount, as it's called in the OTC market. And you can see that the um, CCP has to do a pretty complicated calculation to define what the appropriate uh, initial amount is, because it's not. It's not the case that we're just trading one standard product like um, you know exchanges are with standard rules and so on. We've got, got all these different things that uh, the dealer is doing or the market participant is doing. So it's at the calculation of the initial the calculation of the uh, maintenance margin you know and how it changes day by day is fairly straightforward, but the calculation of the initial margin is much more complicated. But in answer to your question, yes, daily. It's going to be done daily in much the same way as, uh, as it's done for exchanges. At what point do you ask for collateral back, the Lehman effect? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> the, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting that there's actually some, there's actually credit risk even if you're out of the money because if I'm a dealer dealing with, show, you know, if I'm, if I'm a Lehman counterparty and I'm out of the money with Lehman, so my transactions are, are worth uh, <coughs> minus 50 million to me and plus 50 million to Lehman. I think, I, I think actually I got my, my numbers the wrong way around when I was talking about the previous example. Minus 50, then I would, I would be posting uh, collateral with Lehman 
And then the transactions might move in my favor. I don't know whether this is what you have in mind here, but transactions might move in my favor, but Lehman's in financial difficulties. It doesn't give me back the collateral, which it's supposed to give me back when the transactions move in my favor. Then I have an exposure because Lehman goes bankrupt and it owes me, I'm over, I'm, as it were, over collateralized because the transactions moved in my favor, but Lehman didn't, um, <laughs> didn't return collateral to me. And that's, you know, that is a problem that some dealers have as far as Lehman is concerned, I believe. Um, so there's lots of questions here, and we're running out of time. Um, I guess what should we should we close it down now, Chris? Or I think that would be a good idea since we are running out of time. Uh, um, cause, yeah, because clearly there's lots and lots. Of, I'm I'm pleased that uh, the the talk has attracted quite a bit of interest here, and um, I've. Uh, but, uh, you know, clearly we haven't got time to answer all of these questions. Absolutely. So, so I'd just like to sort of finally say thank you very much for all your attention and, and listening so so patiently to me. i will just going to uh, advance the slide. Uh, that's the thank you slide. And then a slide about, about this conference that's coming up next week. Do you want to talk about that, Chris? Absolutely. I just want to first um, thank you, Dr. Hull, for sharing your expertise. It was truly an honor to have you present. And I'd like to thank the audience as well. Um, the conference we're having next week uh, is Premia's Global Risk Conference, and it's held May 14th through the 16th in New York. And you can find out more about attending at www.premia.org. And Dr. Hull will be there presenting, as he mentioned earlier. So I want to thank you all for attending this premium webinar.